Heidi Brooks is going to come up right now and talk about leadership, her perspective on leadership from all of her work at the business school at Yale. Um, again, thank you all for being here. And Heidi, the floor is yours. Thank you. You know, there's been all this conversation uh, about the um, return to the office. It's not a return to work. We worked a lot during the pandemic. I did. Did anybody else work a lot during the pandemic? Yeah. So um, uh, there's, in this conversation of return to the office, um, part of the question has been, um, is, are we returning to a place or returning to a culture? Like, what makes us us? And I have no idea what the Walker and Dunlop offices look like, but I feel like I see you. Like Walker, Walker and Dunlop is here in force in this experience, and I'm really glad to be here. So um, I'm Heidi Brooks. Thank you, Willie, for inviting me. Um, I want to uh, honor uh, a piece of what you said, um, this kind of uh, uh, network effect. I'm very aware of being the only woman on the panel. I'm aware of being a bl black woman on the panel. And so I want to acknowledge that um, Mark invited me uh, or in introduced me to Willie, who invited me. And um, thanks, Mark, wherever you are, if you're here in the room somewhere. Oh, okay, great, thank you. So um, my job is to talk with you about everyday leadership. And I want to start by acknowledging that everyday leadership isn't just individual, it's collective. So hopefully, if I do a good job here, um, we're not, you're not just thinking about this for yourself, you're thinking about this for all of us. And so part of what I'm going to try to do is to integrate some comments uh, that we've heard um, from the speakers yesterday and from your experience here. And I'll do that myself, and I'll also ask for your voices to participate so that everyday leadership as a collective feels like we get a little bit of a taste as we kind of create that lived experience uh, here. I think this is the right place to do it um, and the right audience. Um, so part of... Um, what I wanted to do is answer some of the questions that people have been, have been asking me. One of those questions uh, uh, surprised me. It was about my uh, uh, trajectory. And so I thought that was a really nice uh, uh, question and relevant. I did a PhD in uh, psychology, and uh, it was clinical psychology. I really thought that the skill set of, of the clinician to be able to make a difference in the world uh, called to me and could make a difference in, in the kind of systems that I was interested in touching. And so my original training was in clinical and community psychology, but I don't act as a kind of treating therapist on the kind of mental illness side. I use the same skill set on the side of uh, mental health and well-being. If you kind of blow that out a little bit more, it goes into the domain of positive psychology and how can we really be our best self. And I'm an interventionist. I'm university-based, um, but I started as a, as a psychologist, did a... Um, uh, a, a minute of a postdoc trying to have a more traditional academic career, because that's what one was supposed to do. And I got the message of what I was supposed to do when I was in graduate school. I've always been kind of well-behaved, so I was really trying to be well-behaved and to do what I was supposed to do out of those messages. So I took a kind of a prestigious uh, postdoc and kept looking across the street. I was at Northwestern. I kept looking across the street to Kellogg School of Management, thinking, what's going on over there? What's going on over there? I had been in a family systems lab. I was doing work on children and academic and social competence. Um, but I had grown increasingly interested in what, what happened to those kids as they grew older and as we kind of expanded the capacity to uh, think about competence in and, and, and adults. And my eye kept going across the street. And about three months later, uh, into my postdoc, I moved across the street into uh, a role at the Center for Family Enterprise at uh, Kellogg School of Management. Um, so I think it's no coincidence that I'm, I, I still hang out a little bit with family uh, business. It's not, my, uh, it's, not my, it's not my focus, but I didn't actually know I was coming to a, a, a company with such a strong legacy of, uh, family, um, of family values. I appreciate and can feel, this, feel the uh, continuity of that invitation. I um, wanted to honor that uh, trajectory. Uh, I didn't stay at the Center for Family Enterprise because I went on to, uh, to, to Yale, where I still am. In my professional work, I spend some time um, uh, in advisory mode. So I'm wearing the label of everyday leadership at my group. So I run a company which is a leadership advisory. I talk with companies and leaders about leadership, everyday leadership, and culture. And, uh, and I teach at Yale. And I teach classes uh, that are focused on everyday leadership, they're called things like power and politics, 
interpersonal and group dynamics, and everyday leadership. What people tend to be uh, uh, pretty comfortable with is what I do in the classroom, because most people have, you know, have some sense of what classrooms uh, look like and feel like. What they're a little bit confused about is, what in the world do you do with companies? Like, how does, what does your time look like? Um, so I do some uh, uh, talks, and I do some advisory, kind of sitting around with senior people, thinking about how to shape more strategic intervention. And I do some time, I really create spaces where people can talk to each other. Right? Really kind of double-clicking on the capacity for collective uh, 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 wisdom collective wisdom generation. So I spend a lot of time in small circles with um, a few people who are mostly more senior in an organization, and we do a whole lot of talking to each other and discovering, and my role is to create a trajectory for us to be more uh, effective and, and wiser. Just spent about five weeks with a company who spent a couple of hours, we had a kind of an agenda where they spent a couple of hours reading and looking at stuff, and then they spent an hour a week with me, just the five senior people, and we kind of showed up, and it was kind of like an office hours kind of thing. That's what they wanted to call it. It was an office hours uh, kind of thing. They, they left, um, I think, with more uh, questions than they, uh, than they came with, um, but an understanding that they were asking the right questions about who they are and who they're becoming. So um, my job today is to talk with you about um, everyday leadership. And I did bring you some slides, and I'm very excited that they're, that they're up, and I can almost see, see my notes on the, on the slide. So. Um, a little bit of context uh, uh, setting. We're at a point in time, kind of macro and, and right now, where uh, it's the case that um, uh, the, the world of work is changing. We're all aware of the, kind of the dominant presence of the knowledge uh, economy, um, but I really want to acknowledge some of the difference between then and, and now. And I use this image of, you know, kind of the last year, just kind of thinking about virtual work, but I don't mean to embed the, uh, the conversation entirely in just moments of, uh, of virtual work. And so because the experience of, uh, of now is really different than it has been, it implicates uh, managers, it implicates leaders. And um, part of the difference is that um, because of technology, a lot of the information transfer function of uh, managers is really reduced. Right? And it's replaced with a set of needs to create meaning in an everyday way throughout the culture, and connection and belongingness, and to create a sense of uh, caring, a sense of connection between the organization and the individual. I think that's always been part of the role, but it's become more important uh, now. And so um, we're having uh, you know, a conversation that goes, you know, where if, if the language before is more like command and co coordinate and control, and you know, kind of professional meant kind of distance, and kind of looking confident always and invulnerable always, now we have a language that's starting to come in that some people are working with, and I think some of those people are in this audience, to be more connected and responsive and curious and dynamic and adaptive and caring and vulnerable. And so um, we're not trained for this. <laughs> so it creates a little bit of a crisis. It creates a little bit of a crisis. So we've been talking with people about what they're, uh, what they're facing, what kind of opportunities and interferences they're seeing uh, with this everyday leadership demands and opportunities in their, in their work. And here's some of what people have said. This person that I talked with who's on the far left said, you know, I feel like I've been pretty good um, for 30 years at, the, at what I do. I felt confident, I felt good about that, but after the late last 18 months, now I think I should have studied psychology. And then another uh, um, person really talking about a different space. Um, I asked, you know, what are you really uh, facing? What are some of the challenges of everyday leadership that you're, that you're facing? And this person said, creating more equitable practices in our firm, really across the board, and the, also the huge culture change of being a place of belonging for all rather than for the few. And then, really, everyone is saying you know, this challenge of helping people adjust to the hybrid approach uh, to work. So part of what I'm wondering is, what about you? What are some examples that you're kind of facing in the everyday leadership domain? I tend to hang out with companies that are in big tech, professional service firms, and higher education. So those, these quotes are probably from that domain, but I actually don't think these, these, these comments are domain-specific. I actually think we're all dealing with everyday leadership opportunities and challenges. And so I wonder, 
if you just think for a moment, what are some of the challenges, opportunities that you're facing in your context? What comes to mind? I wonder if we could hear a few voices. Things that come to mind in your experience and perspective. Let's hear from you. Yeah. Um, I think we have some smart, talented people who may not want the exact same uh, commitment and level of success that, that maybe others do. They want to strike much more of a balance in their life, and that's okay too because they're you know, really good, smart people. But it's the, the, the level of uh, maybe the level of commitment that you're asking from them is not the level of commitment that they want to do because they have a different level of priorities in their own life. Yeah. Okay. Should I repeat these so everybody can hear? Okay, so um, the, the heart of that was that the smart people who actually kind of, I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase a, a, a little bit, um, they may not want to work all of the time. Um, unlike many of you, they have, they have ideas of kind of work-life balance, perhaps, that might start to bring in some of the comments and invitation to wisdom about actually seeing this, the, the other generation. Not just seeing, but actually what do we do with this dilemma? Right? We have a certain idea of how we work. Well, we're, we're exhausted. We, we recognize that, right? But we have a work concept, and you seem to be in a little bit of a different paradigm. Am I, am I, am I with yeah. you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. How about some others? What else is on your mind? Yes, please. I think the biggest challenge is how to combine all of these elements, character, culture, and the like, into our economic goal set. So do people hear that one? Okay, so uh, the challenge here is how to combine all these elements into a soup, um, and it, that it's an integration challenge. How do we actually uh, achieve the economic goals of the institution with so many different directions to pull in? Is that a fair add? Yes. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Yes, please. All right, so I think one of the important issues of the day is, is retention of talent. And um, at Claren, we've been hiring lots of younger folks, and I'd say there's a dramatic difference in sort of the things that they value in terms of professional advancement, in terms of what gives them sort of the uh, non-monetary satisfaction of, of the job. And so we, we wrestle with how to, um, you know, fulfill those, those needs and desires with the end game of making them uh, motivated and retention uh, and, and, and building a, a culture and all the things you we're, we're talking about here. Okay, great. And um, do you have a s clear sense of uh, what those things are that are the kind of incentives for them? No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's very similar, Heidi, to what Tom just said previously, yeah. which is just that they seem to be motivated by things that are distinct from what, if you will, this group is motivated by. Yeah. Anybody? Anybody else? Got one in the back here. Um, instead of talking about work-life balance, I wonder if we can talk about work-life synergy, this perfect and used version of work-life balance. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, because it's not like we have figured it out and we're confused by them. We haven't figured it out and we're confused by them, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's both and, right? Okay, good. So, uh, so thank you for those, for those uh, comments and concerns. It helps us to um, you know, kind of anchor this in a way that's um, uh, relevant. So um, I wanted to offer you some, uh, some basics so we could share some language um, and uh, some orientation around this. And so I wanted to uh, give us this ecology of everyday uh, leadership. It's a really simple concept that, that we forget all of the time. We tend to be, think we're working at kind of uh, one level, but actually I really want to introduce this idea that, that leadership happens in an ecology, and we can think about working at all of these different levels, that everyday leadership can be enacted uh, individually within you, it, like a self-leadership, in your relationships with, with people, 
in the group dynamics, and groups can also enact everyday leadership, and at the organizational level. This conference is a beautiful uh, uh, example of all of these topics. Mark talked quite a bit yesterday about some of the uh, intrapersonal uh, uh, components, um, and I will say a couple more things in addition, uh, in addition to that. But this is a good place for us to be able to start. I work what I think about as mezzo. I work across all of these levels, so I don't just come and work with an individual leader and actually ignore some of the context or work with the context and then ignore the individuals. They're all happening at the same time. And we need to be able to think across these different units of analysis, if you will, as we're trying to make sense of how to problem solve, move forward, lead, connect. I thought I, what I would do is, um, is just start by talking about, uh, I'll talk about each level and start kind of inside and then go uh, outwards. And so um, I wanted to, uh, uh, to kind of bring in the Walker and Dunlop, uh, Dunlop context because there's so much focus on the interpersonal in part because uh, Willie is so invested in kind of underscoring and bringing that, um, bringing that out. You know, I, I, I watched um, your talk, Willie, from 2017, given here, inspirational, beautiful. I don't know how many of you are here or have seen this, but it's really worth your time. Not really an intentional plug, but a beautiful alignment with what you're creating here. You know, I really heard um, uh, 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 Greg, our coach yesterday, uh, talk about um, that organizations take on the, the, the personality of, uh, of, of the leader. That uh, I think might be really something for us to pay attention to here. But watching these talk uh, for me was um, an introduction to uh, Walker and Dunlop. And so uh, Willie talks about a story that's real. You could get up and tell the story uh, right now, but this is really an eloquent uh, uh, piece. But in terms of deploying my attention, there was this um, masterful kind of intrapersonal talk that he gave in 2017. And it's really a self-disclosure um, about his marriage falling apart. The marriage was falling apart at that time um, uh, uh, when he tells a story of why, but the point is that he went into a kind of an anger management intensive study, right? mostly because Sheila gave him a book that inspired. He gets uh, back together with Sheila. Mysteriously, the Walker and Dunlop stock price celebrates at the same, t same time with the reunion. All right? So um, the, the thing here is to, to pay attention to, from an everyday leadership perspective, is the really powerful um, and kind of vulnerable um, intrapersonal work that's, that's going on that Willie then uh, talks about out loud. And so part of the work of intrapersonal, the intrapersonal level is a kind of self-awareness and then willingness to talk about it. Now, Willie's level of self-disclosure and vulnerability might not be yours. Um, the point being that it's a direction to start to look in and to ask yourself, what story can I tell about myself? How do I want to be seen? How am I willing to let people know about who I am and what I struggle with in order to make, to kind of normalize that and move in the direction of excellence in that domain, removing barriers? So <clears throat> I thought I would put this together in a story that's depicted in a slide, because part of what I'm talking about is being able to be aware enough of your values that you can put them into action and then create impact. So at the beginning and end of the day, leadership is really about uh, impact, right? So you know, sometimes we get kind of very focused on specific behaviors um, that, we can, that we can enact, but I actually don't like that focus for everyday leadership or for leadership development and, and training as the end point. We get very um, focused on, I am doing the right thing, my behaviors are gold standard, right? But if you're not really producing the goods, the impact is, is lacking. So I think we need to keep the picture in mind of going from behaviors into impact, right? So the answer is out there. Right? And so, but we also need to connect the, uh, the relationship with our, with our values. So what is it that you care so much about that you're willing to come here and take this time out of your life to be able to create some kind of impact? Right? And so being able to ask yourself questions of what it is that you care about so much that would get you to um, commit your time and attention and energy. Right? So kind of some intrapersonal awareness of the values that actually guide you. So you can turn them into commitments that are actionable. We heard quite about th a, a bit about this uh, yesterday from the perspective of thinking about creating a, a, a team. Right? And so speaking with or hearing from um, from Greg, he said, you control the vision. 
Right? Where does the vision come from? It actually comes from your, from your values, what you're hoping to bring to fruition in the, in, in the world. Because we have this uh, experience of most people coming up in firms and contexts and companies because of their subject matter expertise, they get elevated into leadership, we often have to learn how to learn. We have to uh, learn new things. So all of this stuff around vulnerability and self-disclosure and connection, this kind of comment from uh, my friend and uh, client of I should have studied psychology, it's kind of a new way of thinking about uh, a kind of expertise. And so, you know, I like to acknowledge for all the many kind of educated and often over-educated people that I hang out with that, you know, our learning our, in the, kind of the, around our subject matter and our expertise often was in the domain that's on the left-hand side. This kind of factual orientation or procedural learning, the kind of stuff that helped you think good, you know, uh, big thoughts, with conceptual orientation, and then con the kind of conditional learning that helps you think about kind of when and where you can apply things. The leadership domain uh, asks a different uh, kind of thing of you. To be able to um, work on your everyday leadership, we need to add the capacities of metacognitive, thinking about your thinking, noticing where your attention is deploying, noticing what kind of things um, uh, you are thinking about so that you can correct them and adjust them and upgrade them and align them with your values so you can create the impact that you want. You have to be able to notice your thinking. Right. And then the reflective component, to be able to think back on how the day has gone, how the moment has gone, how the year is going, to be able to uh, ask questions of that. So these are all you know, places to be able to look. Often we have not trained in this, and it's not necessarily so difficult individually. Some people can step into it individually and kind of in the privacy of your own home. But what we also need is also collective capacity. So to be able to create these kind of norms in our organizational cultures. And so um, I put it in the intrapersonal uh, uh, space here and talking about it today because um, leaders who can't do it can't lead it. Right? And so it's not like your team can reflect and really create um, something powerful if you can't do it. So um, I think it's an important capacity for us to be able to bring to the table. And it's such a time of learning. Given that work is changing so much, there's a lot of uncertainty. And to Mark's point yesterday, a lot of anxiety and anxiety and uncertainty go together. And so to be able to actually think our way through with all of the resources that we can bring to the table, rather than the kind of reduced cognitive resources that we get just coming from, from, from anxiety. Um, and so we want to be able to, to, uh, to do this. So let me um, switch a little bit to the interpersonal uh, domain to think about what we can do at this, at this level of, of engagement. One of the things to be able to, uh, uh, to, to, to keep, for me to keep, keep doing, is to think back about what was there yesterday on the interpersonal um, uh, front. So I hope that you'll also start thinking about this because it helps us. I know the round table, I really heard the round table is not here this year, and I think the kind of you know, review of this material um, helps us to be able to enact it. We know that um, you know, hearing exciting stuff is great for us stimulating, right? To make it kind of actionable, we actually need to uh, review and to take it in. So I hope you might take up some of this opportunity to review, even when I'm not bringing up uh, things that are, 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 are relevant. Um, in the interpersonal uh, domain, we might think about the perspective that we carry into relationships. There's a lot for us to be able to notice about what we're doing one-on-one. -on -one, right? And so, you know, I teach in a major business school, the context of everyday leadership uh, that I named in part as a complement to strategic leadership. I call it everyday leadership, not to um, uh, compete with strategic leadership decisions at the firm making level and leadership really at that. Uh, level, but to fill out the way that we actually need to be thinking, in my opinion, uh, about our, um, the way that we create and, 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 uh, and enact culture. Right? And so the interpersonal is uh, not a typical way that we think, you know, there, aren't, there haven't been a lot of you know, um, executive education programs, for example, in the interpersonal uh, domain. We tend to think of it's, it's in the private uh, space. However, um, what we know is that um, Relationships at work make a difference. I mean, just thinking about our experience here and how much the focus is on really genuine uh, uh, connection and knowing each other and being known. Um, so we want to bring that in as an important component of how we think about crafting uh, work and allowing some of, some, some of that uh, to take up some air time and some of our uh, um, planning space as we think about uh, relationships at work. So here's one of the reasons that um, 
um, in the interpersonal uh, domain, we actually can get feedback from other people. So I have here the saying that I use a lot in, in this teaching from Dave Bradford, who's emeritus at Stanford. It takes two to know one. Right? So we can understand and value a kind of self-awareness. Uh, but what this brings in is a kind of other awareness. Do we understand how we're perceived from the perspective of others? Right? And so actually knowing in your journal and being able to kind of navel gaze, that's good to a point, right? It, it itself needs a little bit of you know, bounds because we can ruminate ourselves down into a downwards, downwards uh, spiral. But we also need to be aware from a leadership perspective of how we're seen through other people's eyes. Right? And we can't do that ourselves. We actually have to actively get out there and learn uh, about it. Right? And so I just put this, uh, this quote on the left, just telling this story about some of the most successful leaders that Tasha was looking at, actually actively going out and frequently seeking feedback from bosses, peers, employees, their boards, right? And they became more aware, self-aware in the process because they actually had a sense of how they were perceived. And um, they can then have choice about how to come to be perceived as more effective um, by others, right? There's lots, to, there's lots of practice that we can build into that. Um, but it takes two to know one. Right? Notice there that we have a learning role with each other, not just a productivity uh, role, but a learning role with each other to help uh, us kind of gain awareness. So there's another piece of the collective capacity for excellence um, in our everyday uh, interactions with each other. Um, so I started to talk a little bit about uh, feedback. And this invitation here gives us a chance to um, look. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice uh, quote. The important part is that you're driving your own learning and creating a pull factor. Creating pull is about mastering the skills required to drive our own learning. So do we have the skills to drive our own learning? Related to what I was saying before about being able uh, to do metacognitive and reflective uh, learning. And the best piece here at the last line, it's about how to learn from feedback. Yes, even when it is off base, unfair, poorly delivered, and frankly, you're not in the mood. Part of, we think about uh, uh, feedback in the interpersonal domain, often we think about giving feedback, but actually a lot of the energy is being able to solicit feedback. How is it you actually can help people, to, not only by giving them feedback, but by helping them solicit feedback. Um, people need feedback, young people especially need feedback, we all need feedback to be able, we need guidance to be able to align with the agenda, to be able to work our way into um, uh, effectiveness. Um, and you know, it's, it's really worth double clicking on, um, uh, on the message from Dr. Frederick yesterday about all of the tacit information that isn't necessarily in some training materials. How would people know without the guidance and wisdom and honestly self-disclosure um, from the people who actually have been success successful on the path? How do you actually pick up all of those things? So getting them to solicit some feedback. So calling that in everyday leadership um, a basic uh, skill in the interpersonal domain. This is a slide about feedback, the feedback sweet spot. My hope is that we can think about giving useful data. We've got lots of feedback out there that winds up being kind of vague and not very impactful um, because there's no information in it um, or it doesn't actually reveal some of the impact. And so here we want to kind of go high information, um, kind of quality of data and high empathy. Right. So, but to get into that feedback sweet spot, we actually need the skills of, observa obs of observation, so watching people, paying attention, um, having something to say, and of course our kind of annual reviews aren't very helpful in that uh, process, so it's all relationship-based. Can you actually have enough of a conversation going so you know what people are doing, can some, give, give them some regular uh, guidance, um, and do it in a way that actually they feel like there's, you've individually considered them and there's some connection that you can actually create some empathy um, uh, uh, there. And empathy, of course, is not emotionality. It's, um, it's just seeing the, seeing, it, seeing the situation the way they see it. Right? So can you come to the table with some bid for perspective taking, right? especially across difference, if they are a different age, a different uh, race, different kind of, uh, even kind of industry and training and schools can make a difference. The more different they are from you, the more it, you have to kind of take a long walk across to find their perspective, mm -hmm. to be able to see the situation the way that they see it and bring some compassion to it, to find merit in what they're thinking or feeling or doing and not confuse that with your agreeing with it. You don't have to agree with it in order to bring empathy to the situation. You don't have to condone it. You can just see it. You can just see it there, the way that they see it. Right. 
So you can say, you know, I, I, I see that you, you, see, you see work differently than I, than I do. You know, I've spent my uh, uh, career working as hard as I can many, many, many hours, and you have a different concept of it. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer for me. I don't know the answer for you. But can we talk about it? So feedback, I think, is part of just leading into courageous conversation. All right, so can we go from feedback into more courageous conversation? Can we name stuff? Can we name dilemmas? All right, and this is... Um, um, this tends to be hard for people because uh, the, the problem solvers that Willie named, the problem solver wants to have an answer, right? So they don't want to name stuff. You know, I've talked to lots of executives who don't want to name stuff that they don't have an answer for. They don't have an answer in the, in a, as, as, as a process, or you don't actually know what to tell uh, the, the folks, you don't want to name it. But I, I, think, I think we're really missing out by not naming the dilemma and bringing some collective wisdom and just kind of talking to each other uh, to, the, to, the, to the table. Right? so we can make uh, sense, and also build some muscle for tolerating the dilemmas that we're living with. I put this image up of my colleague Marissa, her book called Social Chemistry, because she's got this beautiful data about how much one-on-one -on -one relationships matter in the workplace. And so she's got this idea that you, they're, they're kind of types, so that's what the kind of expansionist and uh, brokers and conveners is. In other words, we, have, we, we manage relationships differently. So there isn't like a one size uh, fits, fits all, but there are different kind of impacts um, from doing this. The, the main point uh, being here, that the, it's the quality, not the quantity of your social relationships and connections. Um, that's actually a predictor here. Um, and it predicts interesting things like your cognitive functioning, your work resilience, and work engagement. Right? And so also talking about the structure of your, of your context. It helps explain things from pay to the quality of your ideas. I won't say too much about Marissa's work, but I wanted to bring it in because of the profound uh, impact on health and happiness. And so our miss on, talk, on, not, on kind of ignoring the interpersonal domain and not thinking of it as part of our culture generically, I think it's quite different uh, here um, in this gathering, um, but actually it's not helping us. So actually helping to create relationships across different demographics and, and, and ages that feel real and that they have meaning uh, can, really, can really help, I, I, I have a hunch, can really help us out, right? And uh, Marissa has good data on this um, uh, question. She was particularly focused on questions of loneliness during the pandemic. Um, and so there's this last piece here, um, that lo loneliness increases the chance of pr premature death by 26%, which is just a huge, um, uh, uh, number, and so, you know, Mark talked yesterday about um, some of the implications of emotional intelligence on the kind of health and wellness uh, aspects. Um, so keeping in mind how much wellness has been um, a focus um, during, the, uh, during the pandemic within organizations and, uh, and, and beyond. Um, and I wonder what you think about, um, uh, for, the, for the two questions that were headed in the direction of the kind of intergenerational differences around how we perceive work and how we work, um, and what work-life synergy might mean? What is the place of wellness in that? How do the young people kind of perceive that and perceive uh, the work? I also have the sense that um, over time, because as we gain more kind of power and status in the organization, our perspective changes, right? So these very same kind of younger generational people might have a very different perspective um, on their own work as they have more experience. So we can look back and think, what did we think when we were 21, 22, but how we wanted to work, what were our concepts? I think that might be actually, that's actually the comparison, not necessarily from who we are now to who they are now, but who were we, were, were we then to who were they then, who are they going to be? when they are 50 whatever, uh, or whatever the comparison age um, uh, might be. It might give us the right question to work towards the kind of, I really love this word, kind of synergy. And then I think we need to talk to each other about how we're going to create this, not just as a product, but as a process. Right? And so some of this uh, kind of energy of, you know, uh, of this interpersonal domain of everyday leadership um, might be relevant there. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about the group and team level. It's where the kind of collective um, comes alive. I tend to work primarily at the group uh, uh, level. Um, I work mezzo, but the group, the, the, the unit where I really intervene and spend time with people, I love groups, I'm just a groups person. I grew up as an athlete, I love teams. Um, I want to uh, kind of energize that I feel, I feel at home within a team. Even though I have no idea actually what any of my clients do, I'm not there for that, right? I trust that they are not there to talk with me about their subject matter expertise. 
space. So um, it doesn't really matter that I don't have, because all across all of the industries, everyday leadership has really similar elements. <laughs> the piece that uh, I, was, I was talking about in terms of the group level is that humans are so fundamentally social, we really understand what it means and all of the dilemmas um, and kind of attendant feelings of being part of groups and not being part of groups. We care so much about belonging. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, Mark's bid for us to uh, pay attention to this, uh, this, this kind of poignant uh, data that he was sharing around the, uh, the, the, the yearning for, for acknowledgement, right, might be a piece of this uh, question around, uh, around uh, belonging and being, and being seen. So, um, a couple of things about group stuff. Okay, so thinking about... Um, <laughs> the group level, one of the most important pieces I think that's just actually um, fun and central work for us all to be atten pay attention to, pull in from Amy Edmondson, who's a scholar at Harvard uh, Business School, has been studying um, psychological safety for a number of years. And um, the, uh, the, the piece about uh, the psychological safety is really just the feeling that people have that they don't have to fear um, a kind of reprisal, some sort of like punishment for interpersonal risk taking. Right? And so in the context of psychological safety, people disclose more of what they're thinking, information that they have, errors that they might have made. It's good for relationship building, it's good for the group uh, dynamics, and it's good for getting the best out of your teams quickly because actually you're sharing information rather than coveting information, trying to reputation uh, manage, um, kind of uh, you know, engaging in all of the things that we do where we've been practicing avoidance, denial, dismissiveness, rather than engagement, approach, and, and, and connection. And so psychological safety is a group level kind of experience, and it's very sensitive to leadership capacity. And so leaders create psychological safety um, primarily by making it safe to take, take interpersonal risk, by actually sharing, self-disclosing, showing a little bit of uh, your own skin in the game, uh, Willie's been doing a, a ton of that in this, in this conference and in the work that he has done. We've, we've heard that Dr. Frederick did that himself and for his children. All right, so a lot of kind of, uh, kind of talking about um, uh, the kind of risk they're taking on in the, in the, in the world. So I have to assume that those, uh, that those uh, 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 sweet kids that were over there are kind of used to this, right? <laughs> are kind of used to this, and so have a sense of psychological safety and like nurturance um, from, uh, from having their, um, uh, their, their father talk with them with pride and love and some vulnerability, um, theirs and, and, and his. So psychological safety um, is really central and, and important, and it takes some skill to be able to, to build it and rebuild it. Psychological safety, easy to kind of break apart with kind of a sigh and a micro moment, you know, um, and it can be harder to build. Right? It's a little bit different than trust, which is a little bit more interpersonal. Psychological safety is more at the group, um, at the group level. All right? Okay, so um, I also want to talk about a kind of related idea of um, the everyday leadership capacity for us to be able to manage failure. Right? So the more that we innovate and are in a, ca uh, in a category of uncertainty, right? returning to the office, a period of taking on a new uh, project where we're, you know, kind of a new acquisition, so there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of examples of uncertainty. And anytime there's uncertainty, there's going to be failure. Some failures we're not even sure are failures, but we need a capacity to be able to manage, uh, to be able to manage failure. There are three things that I wanted to, uh, to share with you, so I'm going to give you three different quotes. The only man who never makes a mistake is the man who never does anything. Here's another one. These are all about failure and dealing with mistakes. This is from Michael Jordan, important context. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. Um, I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times, I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. And then the last one, attributed to Thomas Edison, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Um, so there's a reason for us to be able to not be like allergic to failure, but to actually build muscle for tolerating it. And one of the ways that we can do it is we can actually get more nuanced and differentiated about, about failure. And so, you know, staying in stuff that you can dig into in Amy Edmondson's uh, work, three ways to think about failures. And we can think about simple failures, we can think about complex failures, and we can think about intelligent failures. We want to differentiate those because simple failures, we can just call them mistakes. These are kind of failures where we know how to do it right, but for some reason the process didn't go right. right. Complex failures we can consider to be accidents, 
You know? And in that instance, um, there might be a set of factors that come together in a novel way, despite reasonably familiar um, uh, uh, contexts. Right? But notice mistakes and then accidents, so just a little bit of language differentiation. Right? We're very language sensitive. And then intelligent failures. I'm calling these discoveries. She's calling these dis discoveries. Right? And these are undesired results of thoughtful forays into new territory. And so there are, there are kind of failures that we might experience. We still have all the attendant emotion of failure. Right? Disappointment and horror and fear and uh, anxiety and a little bit of uh, probably some, some shame, whatever happens, depending on the psychological safety, of course, in your context. Right? So these all things all go together. Um, but this, it's a really nice, I think, invitation for us to be able to hold this a little bit uh, differently. I wonder if there are uh, failures that you've experienced uh, that for you feel like they're actually, maybe there's a little bit of room to think of them a little bit differently. Something that maybe you're holding in your, in your setting, in your context, in your, in your year, that maybe you can think about it as a mistake, maybe it's an accident, or maybe it's a, it's a discovery. All right, just by show of hands. Anybody have, have things that come to mind in that, in that domain? Things that might have been failures, but otherwise you might be able to think of it as a discovery or an accident or a mistake. I think it's really worth thinking about so we can get some sense of how to actually bring nuance into that, into that category. Because on a good day, everything's a discovery. We are open. We love the world. We love each other. We love our work. And things just happen. Not every day, as we know, is a good day. Right? On a bad day, we're blaming. We're critical. We actually were kind of destroyed by the kind of sense of, of failure. So we, have, we can bring back a sense of kind of the intra-personal conversation here and bring in some of the framing uh, capacity that can happen at the group level around these things. So um, at the organizational uh, culture level, we can think about um, how all of these things uh, come together and reflect back on some of, uh, some of yesterday. So taking a more meta view, President Frederick started with this idea that our democracy is messy, but it works. Right? So at the organizational level, there might be some messiness on the everyday leadership side of things that there can be mess when we're dealing with humans. It's not all uh, clean, of course. But if you can get yourself to not run from the mess, there might be some uh, capacity there. And Dr. Frederick said, out of dissonance, great things. And I connect that really with, um, with Greg's response to dilemmas, failures, mistakes, and accidents by saying, good, good. Now we can create anew. So really bringing in this culture of capacity to kind of roll with things into the organizational uh, uh, level. The thing that I really want to be able to emphasize um, about this, because we can get pretty grandiose, is that a lot of this happens in really simple actions. You know, Mark talked yesterday about meta moments, about really enacting your best self. Um, I talk about micro moments, the kind of, and these things go together, these kind of micro moments are these everyday junctures, a caring thought, a little bit more uh, connection, some empathy, knowing the person, building relationship, being curious uh, can, make, can make a difference. You know, it can, it can, we could say here that trust is built in these kind of very small uh, uh, moments. And um, so some of these very small moments happens around like introducing people. So the way that uh, people are introduced, it turns out, makes a big difference to the way that they feel like they're being kind of held. And this is particularly uh, sensitive across demographics. And so when we have someone who's less familiar in, in, in front, um, uh, the way that that person is introduced and held and translated to the audience, to the audience makes a big difference to the audience and to the, and, and to the speaker. Um, and so thinking about introductions, there's such an everyday uh, happenstance, either interpersonally, just one-on-one -on -one introducing or three-on-one, of introducing a new person or in a setting that's more like this. Giving feedback, micro moments. This doesn't have to be long, big meetings, but a little bit of micro moment capacity to give feedback or pull feedback, to create some pull. Running meetings, um, dealing with conflict, participation in decision making, getting pe people's voice into the, on, on, on the table. Just some examples of everyday leadership junctures that you can pay attention to uh, in, your, in your life and work. And I wanted to start to um, to close out by acknowledging that the future, I say the future is real, right? Um, and I say that because um, 
we're so kind of um, drawn to this um, short-term demand culture, and we're so reactive to the, to, the, to the moment. The reactivity of now has the lion's share of our, of our, of our attention. Um, we tend to discount the future, but given some of the threads that we're hearing from all of the talks and that I'm trying to underscore here, um, the way that we behave in our everyday leadership uh, now creates a trajectory into the future of what our organizational culture is like and how people have a lived experience of the values that we're looking to transmit. So we have to really be aware of a uh, kind of um, overemphasizing now the trade-off cost is to, uh, is to the development capacity for tomorrow. Now, I also say the future is real uh, because I'm really pointing to being real. Right? So the future is in being real. Can we actually get more real? So a little further away from the old school concept of being kind of separate um, from people and getting a little bit more real and being with people as part of the capacity that we can uh, start to develop. Uh, really, finally, how do we practice? I consider practice and all of, almost all of my uh, teaching is more like going to the gyms where we're really just trying to work out and build capacity for being able to enact the everyday leadership capacities that I just talked about. We train in things like speech acts. So, you know, if most of what you uh, wind up speaking uh, about winds up being advocacy, you might be missing out on some other co uh, components of speech. So if you're asking things of people, we're well trained in advocacy, so we tend to be pretty um, uh, strong in advocating. We have a little bit of weakness around advocating for our feelings, as Mark talked about yesterday. But the big ad that we can add into our everyday leadership is being able to frame talking with people about the context of why and doing a little bit of translating, tremendously helpful for the young people because they may be coming from a very different uh, place and the advocacy may be translated a little bit differently um, uh, by them. There's, so there are four speech acts, framing, advocacy, um, illustration, and, and inquiry. Getting more inquiry into your world and life, so asking people, making a bid for mutuality, right? So going from kind of a, a, a tell style into an ask, and not just completely, but just adding it to your, uh, adding it to your framing. And illustrating, of course, is all about showing people what you're imagining, telling stories and such. And so that's part of what we practice in the everyday leadership gym, with the hope that it all comes together for everyday leadership uh, impact. I think the study takes a while. Um, I'm definitely still on the path um, uh, myself, and it's part of what I enjoy the most about, uh, about my work, and very much what I've enjoyed uh, about this uh, conference. And um, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you so much for listening.